Hi, my name is Dr. Linda Lowenstein. I'm a professor of veterinary pathology in the Department of Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology at the University of California at Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. My topic for today is the pathology of non-human primates, particularly those that are housed in zoos. And my experience with non-human primates has been at both national primate centers and in zoological settings, as well as within our zoological medicine service at UC Davis. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues at various zoos and primate centers who have given me some of the materials that I will present today. If we could have the first slide, please. There are no really good texts dealing exclusively with the pathology of zoo primates. There are several that you can resort to um, to help you in this field. One is this two-volume series, The Non-Human Primates, published by Ilse Monographs on Laboratory Animals. And although it deals mostly with laboratory primates, many of the diseases will be the same. There's also a book that was published in the 1980s, uh, edited by Dr. Benershka called Primates, the Road to Self-Sustaining Population, and there's quite a large amount of material in there on primate diseases. While not strictly dealing with pathology, you can find out more about primate diseases in volumes of Dr. Fowler's text on uh, zoo and wild animal medicine and some of the other zoological medicine texts. And then the literature in Journal of Medical Primatology, Journal of Zoo and Wild Animal Medicine, and occasionally Journal of Wildlife Diseases will also help you learn more about these species. The challenge of dealing with primates in zoos is the vast number of species that one might encounter. You might see anything from this pygmy marmoset, which is the smallest of the primates, to the lowland gorilla, which is the largest of the primates. Along with size come many different adaptations for different lifestyles that these primates would have in the wild. Gorillas, for example, and this is a postmortem of a mountain gorilla in Rwanda, have evolved to be largely herbivorous and therefore have a very large, capacious colonic system with tinea and haustra, looks a little bit like what you'd expect in a horse, to, at, as a caudal fermentation chamber. On the other hand, the colubine monkeys, represented here by this Asian langur, but also by the African colobus monkeys, have evolved a complicated sacculated stomach for anterior fermentation of vegetable materials. This is a simple stomach from a Barbary macaque compared with a complex sacculated stomach of a Hahnemann langur. In another picture, this is the time the stomach of a Duke Langer, showing the complicated stomach with the presaccus, which is non-glandular, the glandular saccus, and tubular stomach progressing into the duodenum. Some of the New World monkeys are also folivores or leaf eaters. And Although their GI tract is much less complex, it also has evolved to have a very large capacious stomach for holding a volume of feed and then a fairly large but not nearly as complex colon for caudal fermentation and digestion. On the other hand, some of the New World primates that are largely insectivorous or frugiferous, it's the cotton top tamarind, have a very simple straight GI tract. And other New World monkeys with a more complex dietary repertoire have a more complex GI tract, as in this teeny monkey, stomach, a fairly long small intestine, ilium, fairly big cecum, and typical of New World monkeys, a very simple colon without tinea and haustra. So it's um, important to know the lifestyles of these animals to love something about their biology and natural history in order to better interpret the lesions that one sees. Animals like the chimpanzee, common chimp, 
and the baboons and macaques are more omnivorous, and their gastrointestinal tract somewhat resembles that in a, of a dog in terms of length, although they have tinea and haustra in the colon. Because of these dietary modifications, it's often not possible to provide animals with exactly the diet they need in captivity. We can't always grow the species of plants and that they would eat in the wild. And so several of the things we see in zoo primate pathology have to do with inappropriate diets. This is a Kukuya colobus monkey, and Kukuya colobus monkeys develop a gluten hypersensitivity when fed routine monkey biscuits that contain wheat. The end result, and this is a colonic biopsy, is blunting of the villi, dilated lacteals in this case, and the presentation that fairly similar to that of humans with sprue. If these animals are put on an appropriate diet or a monkey biscuit that is, does not have wheat in it, this lesion will resolve. Diets that are too high in carbohydrates or diets that are fed irregularly, for example, um, an animal might be fed a large meal to tide it over to the next day or even over the weekend um, in the old days, that would result in gastric bloat. And this is a, a Francoise Langer, again with a complicated sacculated stomach, greatly distended from bloat, and I think you can appreciate the congestion of the abdominal vasculature secondary to gastric dilatation. Trying to provide animals with appropriate diet, including leafy browse, is important. But even then, we can get into trouble. If animals select to eat things like the stems instead of the leaves, because the plant might be unfamiliar to them, or for whatever reason, we can see phytobezoars, or string impactions. And this is the stomach of a langur. And here you can see, continuing on into the tubular stomach and duodenum, this long mat of plant fibers, or phytobezoar, which led to the animal's demise. These are New World monkeys. Saki monkey is a Cebus, and the golden lion tamarind peeking behind him is a, um, a caltrichid. And New World monkeys in general require a higher protein in their diet than Old World monkeys. And when that isn't provided, we can see a variety of problems, especially with the little calithricids, which include the marmosets and tamarinds. We can see a, a wasting disease called marmoset wasting syndrome or various other things. And this may be due to inappropriate diet as well as complex things that we don't yet understand. A manifestation of low protein in the diet is villus atrophy in the testin. This is in a an aotus owl monkey, and this can lead to malabsorption. There's also thinning of the colonic mucosa as well. New World monkeys require vitamin D3 in their diets, and when that's not present and when they're not exposed sufficiently to natural sunlight, they will develop nutritional osteodystrophy. The main manifestation of nutritional osteodystrophy in the New World primates, like this larger seabed, or woolly monkey is enlargement of the, both the maxilla and the mandible in this skin necropsy preparation. You can see the great enlargement of both the maxilla and the mandible. And they'll also develop folding fractures of the ribs and long bones. Many of the New World monkeys um, are very sensitive to deficiencies of other vitamins and minerals, such as vitamin E and selenium, which in the New World monkey work in consort. In owl monkeys, deficiency in vitamin E and selenium can lead to hemolytic anemia and resultant hemoglobinuria and tubular hemosiderosis in the kidney. Rec you can only rectify this by giving both appropriate amounts of both vitamin E and selenium. All non-human primates, prosimians through great apes, require vitamin C in their diets. Absence of vitamin C will result in scurvy, and the manifestation of vitamin C may differ from species to species. This is periarticular hemorrhage in aresis. Um, periarticular hemorrhage and gingival bleeding are the main manifestations of scurvy in the old world macaques. 
And part of that periarticular hemorrhage is due to the Salter type 2 fracture right through the epiphyseal plate, articular cartilage here, zone of cartilaginous proliferation here, trabecula here, and an area of necrosis and hemorrhage and fracturing along the epiphysis. In New World monkeys, there's an unusual manifestation called a cephalohematoma. Here, this little squirrel monkey has a greatly domed head with necrosis of the skin overlying it. And radiographically, we can see that what this is due to is elevation of the periosteum, which has become mineralized, and the development of a huge hematoma, which is above the calvarium. And here in this necropsy preparation, this is the calvarium and the ossified periosteum of the cephalohematoma. Just because animals are on a commercial diet does not mean they can't get vitamin C deficient. And a few years ago, there was a misformulation of a primate biscuit by a very reputable manufacturer, and that led to losses at several primate centers, in both Old World and New World monkeys, from vitamin C deficiency or scurvy. In an attempt to rectify this problem, many zoos will feed citrus fruits to their animals as a ready source of vitamin C, and most animals greatly appreciate this addition to their diet. However, vitamin C causes enhanced absorption of iron, and in some species, this can lead to iron overload or hemosiderosis, and even, in the case of lemurs, hemochromatosis. This is the relatively simple GI tract of a black lemur, and what you can see here is red-brown discoloration of the anterior GI tract, and this is due to the accumulation of hemosiderin-laden macrophages in the lamina propria of the duodenum. These animals also accumulate iron in their liver, and this progresses to destruction of the liver with cirrhosis or no and nodular hyperplasia, so-called pigmentary cirrhosis, and occasionally even to the development of hepatic tumors or hepatomas. One theory as to why this should happen is that in the wild, these animals eat diets that are rich in plant that may be high in tannins or phytates, and tannins and phytates normally bind iron in the GI tract. In most mammals, absorption of iron is limited. The theory is that in these animals, because iron is usually so tightly bound in their diet, they've evolved to more aggressively or avidly absorb iron. In the absence of those tannins and phytates and the present of presence of citric acid and the presence of a relatively high iron diet, this mu lack of mucosal barrier leads to the overaccumulation of iron. And we also see iron accumulation, and this is a, a pearls Prussian blue stain of a liver of a marmoset, and we also see iron accumulation in the calithricids and in the great apes. These animals are also apt to be fed vitamin C, and that may play a role in it. Um, also, uh, diets that are relatively too high in iron may play a role, as well as underlying infectious disease processes. Interestingly, the calithricids, even though they accumulate quite a lot of iron, uh, have not yet been known to develop cirrhosis. This may be because of other factors at play in the lemurs. Um, there's a possibility of viral hepatitis in many of the prosimians, including lemurs and galagos, and perhaps the cirrhosis that develops in the face of hemosiderosis in the lemurs is a result of a multifactorial problem. This is a case of cirrhosis in a galago. It's a post-inflammatory cirrhosis. And again, the etiology of this is unknown, but a virus is suspected, possibly a hepadenovirus. And there's some preliminary work going on in this several institutions. Water quality is also important, not only from the standpoint of infectious diseases. These are the teeth of a orangutan, fairly normal. And this is an example of enamel hypoplasia and pitting in another orangutan. We think that this may be due to fluoridation of the water and a degree of fluorosis. Fluorosis is also an issue in some of the lemurs in which a hyperostotic condition results, and that has been published and worked up by the people 
the St. Louis Zoo. So in cities where fluoridation of water is routine to prevent dental caries in human primates, the consequences for some non-human primates may be a pathologic condition, such as the tooth or bone lesions. Atherosclerosis is a common problem in many primates, including New World primates such as this TD monkey. Because New World monkeys require high protein in the diet, some institutions who feed a more natural diet will give them eggs. And in the wild, these animals would probably eat the eggs of birds that they found in the forest canopies, um, along with insects and other things. But if an animal uh, has a familial predisposition like this TD monkey, or um, selectively picks eggs out of the diet, as well as other high cholesterol items, atherosclerosis can result. And here we can see this pretty impressive yellow plaques in the aorta of this TD. Um, some of the other New World monkeys on high cholesterol diets will also develop cholesterol gallstones. And this is from an owl monkey. Atherosclerosis is seen in all primates from prosimians up through great apes. And this is a case of atherosclerosis involving the basal artery in a slow loris, which is a prosimian. And here in the ascending aorta of an orangutan and the descending aorta of another orangutan. Um, an interesting condition we've uh, recognized recently occurs in howler monkeys, and howler monkeys, genus Alawata, in the wild also get atherosclerosis. Freshly caught out of the wild animals will have a degree of atherosclerosis. And this animal, which was a captive animal, a uh, Bolivian red howler monkey, has atherosclerosis involving the renal artery. Um, and you can see here the intimal plaques with foam cells. And this has led to glomerular lipidosis or glomerular atherosclerosis. And this has also been seen in black howler monkeys as well. Again, you can see the atheromatous plaques here in the artery. Another thing in zoos that we don't tend to see in vivarial settings is that uh, animals may be of different species may be housed in fairly close proximity, either in mixed species exhibits or um, in adjacent enclosures. These are squirrel monkeys, genus Cymeri, and squirrel monkeys carry two different herpes viruses, which when they infect other New World primates can cause very serious disease. This is a young squirrel monkey with orocutaneous ulcerations from herpes virus Tamarinus, or herpes T. And this lesion is characterized by ballooning degeneration and intranuclear inclusion bodies typical of a herpes virus. When this virus gets into other species, such as this owl monkey, it causes systemic illness, including multifocal hepatic necrosis and encephalitis and a variety of other manifestations. And here we can see the intranuclear inclusion, the cowdery type A inclusion of an owl monkey infected with herpes tamarinus. This isn't just an artifact of uh, experimental inoculation. There have been outbreaks in zoos as well. And the take-home message is that you should never house squirrel monkeys with other New World monkeys. Squirrel monkeys carry also a gamma herpes virus, herpes cymeri, which is capable of causing lymphomas and lymphoproliferative disorders in other primates. This is a black-tailed marmoset, or was a black-tailed marmoset, and you can see axillary uh, lymphadenopathy, inguinal lymphadenopathy, and hepatomegaly. And this animal had lymphoma uh, from being housed in an enclosure with squirrel monkeys. The macaques, particularly the rhesus monkey, are host to another herpes virus, herpes B, or Cercopithecine herpes virus 1, also called herpes virus simii. And this virus is capable of causing fatal encephalitis and disseminated disease in African primates, such as colubine monkeys, and also in humans, uh, where encephalitis has been reported in laboratory workers. 
And very seldom in the macaques do we see disseminated disease, but one exception is the bonnet macaques, and this is a bonnet macaque. And here you can see severe oral, mucocutaneous, and glossal ulcers. And these are characterized here by ulceration and vesicle formation. And this is the characteristic inclusion bodies and syncytial cells that we see in herpes B infection. In aberrant hosts, there will also be a systemic infection, as I mentioned, which may include hepatitis and pneumonia, as well as encephalitis. Another herpes virus that can cross species lines are the varicella type herpes viruses. And this is a patus monkey with a severe um, ulcerative creeping eruptions of a hepatic infection, and also evidence of self escoriation because of pruritus. Varicella viruses cause a typical vesicular and ulcerative lesion that differs from that of herpes simii in the presence of these exfoliated ballooning keratinocytes, which will also have intranuclear inclusion bodies in them. This appearance, these very large cells in the vesicular fluid, is pathognomonic for the varicella group of herpes viruses. It's not quite clear who the natural host is for the primate varicellas, or the non-human primate varicellas. It's thought that perhaps it's, it is Asian macaques, and that the African monkeys, which are much more severely infected, are aberrant hosts. So it's not a good idea to house Asian and African species in close proximity. Proximity, proximity to the human public, viewing public, is also another issue in zoos. And this is a case of varicella, or chicken pox, in an adolescent male, or post-adolescent male. And this is a case of chicken pox in a chimpanzee. Now, the chimp and gorilla varicella viruses are supposed to be distinct for the human virus, but at the same time as we were experiencing a large outbreak of varicella in adolescents and young adults in California, uh, we also saw varicella concomitantly in chimpanzees um, in zoological collections. Measles is another highly contagious disease that can be spread from the viewing public and from caretakers to the animals. This is measles in a human. You can see inflammation in the lips and uh, again the chin. And this is measles in a juvenile macaque with blepharitis, blepharospasm, chemosis, inflammation around uh, the lips, chelitis, and, and a rash. This is a typical measles rash. It can be quite severe, almost confluent. And when it heals, it tends to be somewhat hyperkeratotic and develop these silvery scales that are thought to be fairly typical. Sometimes very hard to appreciate the rash in species like gorillas or uh, with pigmented uh, skin. Histologically, the rash is, u is really caused by a reaction of dermal vessels, uh, but occasionally you will find syncytial cells typical of a more bilivirus infection in the epidermis itself. Measles also causes a pneumonia, which is centered around small bronchioles, may lead to bronchial plugging and atelectasis. There's exfoliation of bronchial epithelial cells as well as histocytes, and if you're lucky, the presence of these syncytial cells uh, with some cytoplasmic inclusions. We usually think of measles for its cutaneous and respiratory involvement, but in fact, GI involvement is often the most important cause of morbidity and mortality. And here we can appreciate a duodenal uh, infection with measles, this time in a TD monkey. And the syncytial cells here are present both in lamina propria and in the epithelium. A consequence of measles may be abortions and stillbirths and birth defects. Uh, this little macaque had uh, hydrocephalus, and it may be that neural tube deficits are responsible for the contractures and arthrogryposis seen in this case. Respiratory infections uh, transmitted from humans to non-human primates in zoological settings can be a real threat. Uh, because of this, great apes are often kept behind glass, and so are other primates. Uh, but in our more naturalistic zoos, there's often some degree of public um, exposure to the animals. This is a case of Haemophilus pneumoniae, pneumonia in a young bonobo. 
Of course, one of the biggest worries in terms of respiratory disease transmission is tuberculosis. And in this era of the recrudescence of tuberculosis and particularly antibiotic resistant strains, this is a real worry in zoos. In the old days, TB was responsible for the majority of the deaths in zoos. Um, if animals didn't die from severe nutritional problems, they died from TB. And this is a case of TB in a chimpanzee. You can see a fibrinous exudate over the heart and these large nodules within the lung on the uncut surface are represented by these granulomas. In non-human primate tuberculosis, it can be very difficult to find acid-fast organisms. And you have to look very carefully in this slide. But there is one, if I can get it to focus, there is one little acid-fast organism present just here in this multinucleated giant cell. We think that VAPA respiratory infections with viruses also predispose to the development of bacterial air sacculitis. And many of the primates, from new worlds to great apes, and in this case lesser apes, like this Siaman gibbon, have extensive laryngeal diverticular or air sacs. This throat pouch in the orangutan is in fact a laryngeal air sac. And here we can see the open air sac, laryngeal air sac from an orangutan, and the fibrous adhesions that occur after inflammation. And these can become quite severe, and it's a very serious problem in zoo-housed orangutans particularly. But we also can see air sac infections in a variety of other species as well. Even metazoan parasites can be uh, a problem in zoos, and these can be transmitted from humans. Uh, particularly in areas where um, the animals are used in shows and there may be direct contact. This is a case of human pinworm in a chimpanzee. And here you can see not only highlights caused by photography, but little fine, focus a little better, um, little fine thread like parasites that are Enterobius vermicularis. And not only is this a heavy enteric infection, but in chimpanzees, this agent will become invasive. Here we can see lumen, and down here we can see a pinworm that has invaded into the submucosa. These will migrate out uh, perirectally, even causing draining fistulous tracts around the perineum. So they can be a serious problem. The slow loris nictisibus kukang is host to a parasite. Uh, called ter Pterogotermatides nictisibi. And this parasite, when it gets into other species, particularly New World monkeys, can create very severe and fatal enteritis. The animals don't even need to be in direct contact, since cockroaches and other insects can act as intermediate hosts and transmit these from exhibit to exhibit. Another parasite that can spread from animal to animal using the cockroach or other insects as an intermediate host is gondolinemiasis. And gondolinema causes uh, pharyngeal inflammation and proliferation in New World monkeys. In Old World monkeys, gondolinemiasis is usually an inapparent infection. But in these New World monkeys, the effect can be quite striking, uh, including this very proliferative glossitis and stomatitis in a TD monkey. And here we can see uh, from that particular TD monkey this necrosis and hyperplasia of the surface epithelium and the presence of the parasites insinuated within the stratum spinosum. Ileal sequel junction enlargement in this animal. It's a rather old photograph, but you can see the large numbers of acanthocephalids present here. And these are, can also have uh, various insects as intermediate hosts. We see this in wild-caught animals, and they seem to be worse in animals when they first enter into captivity. And these parasites will actually burrow through the wall. They're encased in a fibrous response and will eventually, can eventually rupture and cause severe peritonitis. So acanthocephalid infection. Um, in addition to insects, like cockroaches and pill bugs and things uh, being present in zoological settings that may have a natural substrate. 
Most zoological collections have a real problem with feral animals, and these will include both rats and mice, um, opossums, skunks, a variety of animals, including domestic cats. Domestic cats, as we all know, are hosts, definitive hosts for toxoplasmosis. And New World primates and prosimians particularly, the lemurs, are exquisitely sensitive to toxoplasmosis. Now, not all zoo breaks, outbreaks of toxoplasmosis come from cat feces. The practice of feeding meat, again to increase the protein in the diets of some of these animals, can also lead to toxoplasmosis. And horse meat has been implicated in toxo in outbreaks in several zoological collections. The main manifestation of toxoplasmosis in both the lemurs and the New World monkeys is a fulminating interstitial pneumonia. You can see these lungs have failed to collapse, and these are lungs from a juvenile cotton top tamarind, Squinus oedipus. And this is due to this florid exudative interstitial pneumonia. Seen here, large numbers of macrophages with lesser numbers of lymphocytes and plasma cells, marked fibrin exudation, and um, destruction of the necrosis of some of the alveolar septa. Uh, tachyzoites are sometimes difficult to see in H&E sections, but on imprints they become readily available. Toxo is widely disseminated in these animals, including an encephalitic involvement, and you sometimes see tissue cysts in multiple different organs, including liver and others. There may be necrosis of the intestinal tract, acute necrotizing pancreatitis, and necrotizing mesenteric lymphadenitis as well as the organisms gain entry through the GI tract. Another disease that can be transmitted by um, vermin on zoo grounds or by diet is calotricid hepatitis. And calotricid hepatitis is caused by lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. This is a virus of rodents. It's believed to get into zoological collections either through the practice of feeding pinky mice, immature mice and um, and rats to these animals as a source of protein and dietary enrichment, or by um, wild mice that may be present in collections shedding the virus in urine and feces, or by the wild mice being ingested by some of these New World monkeys who will eat them if they can catch them. And the lesion that we see is that of a necrotizing hepatitis, multifocal random necrosis, and quite a lot of swelling um, of the hepatocytes. There are no inclusion bodies with this disease. And it's also a systemic disease, not just a hepatitis. And here we can see phlebitis in the kidney around one of the renal veins. And also in some animals, uh, we see an interstitial pneumonia represented here in this pygmy marmoset. Provision of very naturalistic habitats is a good thing for non-human primates in zoological collections. It's, a, it's just a much nicer environment for them, but it does carry other hazards. These kinds of substrates are very hard to clean, and the provision of a water element within exhibits can be a source of infection for a variety of agents. Those were spider monkeys, and this is a case of intestinal amoebiasis in a spider monkey, and amoeba histolytica is thought to be the major pathogenic amoeba, but there are other ones that have not yet been fully characterized that possibly play a role. And here we can see severe ulceration and hemorrhage in the intestine. And these organisms often become septicemic and extend most usually to the liver, but also occasionally to the brain. In the colobine monkeys with their complex stomachs, amoebiasis can also affect the glandular gastric mucosa. This is a Duke Langer, a uh, presaccus here, which is non-glandular, and the glandular saccus, and you can see the marked hyperemia and erosions due to amoebiasis. Almost anything that a normal old world monkey can get in the lower GI tract, a colobine monkey can get in the stomach. So whipworms have been reported from colobine stomachs. Amoebiasis is in this case. Um, Trichomoniasis, a variety of agents. 
These are amoeba in the intestinal tract. You can see that they, in this case, they're microinvasive, uh, penetrating here just to the basement membrane and here beneath the basement membrane. And they can become deeply invasive. This is in the submucosa. And here we can see the characteristic features of amoeba, the very small nuclei that help you distinguish them from um, host inflammatory cells, and sometimes it's not all that easy. And these smaller organisms are trichomonads, uh, which can also cause a problem. It's usually uh, Tritrichomonas mobilensis. A case of an amoebic brain abscess, uh, secondary to amoebic enteritis. And this animal also had Shigella uh, cultured from the brain as well. Uh, recently, we've recognized a, a novel amoeba, uh, Balamuthium mandrillaris. <coughs> this work was done by Dr. Bruce Rideout and collaborators at San Diego Zoo. And this causes a meningitis and disseminated disease. Uh, here we have meningitis in a young gorilla due to Balamuthium mandrillaris. And here we have a pyogranulomatous hepatitis in an older gorilla due to the same agent. And it's unusual among amoebae in that it does elicit quite an inflammatory response. Many of the other amoebae are more invasive and necrotizing and not so granulomatous and fibrosing. So that's Ban Balamuthium mandrillaris. Continuing along with the theme of GI parasites, um, this is Balantidium coli. Balantidium is usually in most old world monkeys not a problem uh, unless the animal is immunosuppressed with one of the primate immunodeficiency viruses. However, in the great apes, particularly gorillas, also orangutans, and to a lesser extent chimps, Invasive balantidiasis can be a, a chronic problem, even leading to, the, to uh, severe inflammatory bowel disease requiring resections of portions of the bowel. Uh, the great apes are also uh, susceptible to development of hyperinfections with strongyloides stercorealis, baby bonobo. The adult females are small worms that insinuate themselves in the crypts of the upper intestinal tract. They lay eggs, the larvae hatch out in the intestinal tract and normally go into the ground where they um, go through stages of their life cycle and then are picked up by the host. However, with Strongyloides stercorealis, the larvae can reinvade farther down in the GI tract, leading to superinfections. After larval penetration, the larvae go through the lymphatics and bloodstream to the lungs where they're coughed up and swallowed. And this phase can lead to a very severe pneumonia. So fatalities from strongyloides used to be quite common in great ape youngsters particularly, and it was due to a combination of both a pneumonia and an enteritis. <coughs> we still occasionally see this. Enteric pathogens common to monkeys that are housed, monkeys and apes that are housed in, in vivaria are also common to zoo monkeys, and as I mentioned, the fact that they have a natural substrate makes it difficult to rid enclosures from some of these organisms. This is a case of chronic shigellosis in a gibbon, and there have been many reports of outbreaks of shigellosis in primate collections in zoos. Uh, the classic lesion of shigellosis uh, that should raise your index of suspicion is herniation of the glands through the muscularis mucosae and into underlying lymphoid patches. Uh, shigella may vary anywhere from an acute fulminating hemorrhagic dysentery to a chronic, ongoing, debilitating disease. Salmonellosis is also seen in zoological collections. Salmonella typhimurium, Dublin, and others um, have been identified. Like Shigella, Salmonella can range from an acute uh, secretory problem, usually not so hemorrhagic as Shigella, uh, to uh, more chronic problems in fibrinonecrotic enteritis, as we see here in a spider monkey. Uh, salmonellosis is much more common in zoos than in vivaria, largely because of the presence of feral birds and rodents uh, that are often present in the natural exist naturalistic exhibits on zoo grounds. And salmonella often goes septicemic, and here we see the liver of the same spider monkey, greatly um, distended lymphatics, edema around the hilus, and there was necrosis within the liver. <coughs> Yersinia is another enteric pathogen. Yersinia is most common in areas with um, wet 
climate conditions. So in California, we tend to see it in the cooler, wetter months. It gains entry through the GI tract. And in the squirrel monkey, we can see this area of hemorrhage and necrosis overlying a pyrus patch um, and quickly will go to the spleen, the liver, and elsewhere. It may present as an acute fulminating disease without diarrhea um, or a more chronic process. Here we have necrosis overlying the pyrus patches in this opened intestine. And you can see how thin the normal intestine is in, in most non-human primates. And here in this bush baby is a case of chronic pseudotuberculosis from Yersinia with uh, multiple chronic abscesses in liver and spleen. And histologically, the characteristic large flower petal or lobulated bacterial colonies accompanied by necrosis helps to make the diagnosis. Other enteric infections that we see but are less usual include the atypical mycobacterial infections. This is atypical mycobacterial enteritis in a cyaman gibbon. In many primates, this, this should be an indication of immune suppression, and this is often the sequel to simino, simian immunodeficiency virus infection. However, this probably was not the case in the cyaman. Atypical mycobacterial enteritises are characterized by large numbers of histiocytic cells, which on acid fast stain contain myriads of acid fast organisms. Uh, fight Farako is often more useful than Zeal Nielsen in demonstrating these, and occasionally Oramine Red O or some other stains are necessary uh, to highlight the organisms. In addition to pathogens being a problem in naturalistic enclosures, uh, plantings can also be a problem. Not only may animals eat things that are inappropriate, causing um, the phytobasors that I showed you earlier, but occasionally toxic plants find their way into exhibits. Um, or are the periphery of exhibits, and the animals ingest those. And there have been reports of things like deadly nightshade poisoning in um, lemurs, such as these guys here. Other things that, that primates might pick up from the exhibit include heavy metals. There have been reports of zinc toxicosis in primates, usually not a fatal problem, but zinc toxicosis due to the ingestion of pennies, which are lar largely full of zinc. And in older zoos, the ingestion of lead paint um, or um, lead solder from uh, pipes and metal can lead to lead poisoning. And this was from a baboon. And you can see the discoloration of the gingiva, the typical so-called lead line. Uh, most primates evolved in the tropical regions of the world, and even in regions with fairly mild climates, we can see consequences of their intolerance to cold. Uh, these are, are some cherry crown mangabees from a zoo in the southeast, and rather than having the long tails that they should have, you can see that the tail on this individual is truncated, and this is because he had cold shock uh, to the tail, and had, the tail had to be amputated because of, partially amputated because of necrosis. And this cold shock doesn't require freezing temperatures. It's not a true frostbite. Um, Jay Holshu from LA County Diagnostic Lab was able to demonstrate that there's an arteriopathy that occurs probably secondary to chronic vasospasm in the tails, which eventually leads to ischemic necrosis. Um, in zoos, you have to be aware of species sensitivities. And this is a lung mite, pneumonisis. And we usually think of it as an incidental inapparent infection in most old world monkeys. But in some of the old world monkeys, such as the colobines, and particularly things like the Duke Langer, it can create a very serious and even fatal pneumonia. And here we can see these huge nodules in the lung of another Duke Langer from lung mites. Um, differential here, of course, would have to be tuberculosis or some other bacterial pneumonia. Um, mites can be seen within these lesions with varying accompaniment of inflammation bronchiectasis. Okay, there are many diseases um, of unknown etiology, and particularly enteric diseases. We see chronic colitides, both in old world monkeys and new world monkeys, uh, particularly in the marmosets and tamarins. Chronic colitis is, is a real issue and a rate limiting factor in, in captive propagation. And uh, these colitises are often fairly nonspecific, some widening of the necks of the glands, some uh, 
crypt dilatation and crypt abscesses and moderate to marked inflammation or at least infiltration with immune reactive cells. Often these are culture negative and it's believed that this may result from initially a damage by an agent such as, as a Shigella, a Salmonella, a Campylobacter. And we also see Campylobacter aniridites in um, zoo animals. And that these can lead to um, a hyperreactive population of immune reactive cells, lymphocytes and plasma cells in the lamina propria. That subsequent exposures to a variety of antigens, be they infectious antigens or non-infectious things like dietary antigens, can exacerbate um, the enteritis and the diarrheal problem. Another problem in uh, zoo animals of uncertain pathogenesis is um, chronic renal disease. This is an elderly slow loris that had a multifaceted renal disease including tubular necrosis, sclerosis, pyelonephritis, uh, basically an end-stage kidney with multiple, from multiple insults. Polycystic kidney disease, this time in a New World monkey. New World monkeys, another besides the colitis, rate limiting um, problem is interstitial nephritis and glomerulonephritis, seen here in an owl monkey. And um, again, the underlying um, pathogenesis is uncertain. Old World monkeys, too, suffer from chronic renal disease. This is a case of chronic interstitial nephritis in a Duke Langer. Here you can see some pallor and scarring in the medulla. And chronic interstitial nephritis is also seen in the great apes, like this bonobo and this orangutan. So chronic renal disease is, is an important issue. It usually affects older animals, although young animals may also be affected. And um, we suspect dietary agents, um, as well as other factors, may be involved. Cardiac disease is also a problem in zoo animals, particularly as they age. This is the heart of a mandrel uh, with evidence of severe scarring and fibrosis in the heart. Fibrosing cardiomyopathy is one of the leading causes of death, particularly sudden death, in the great apes. In this case, in a chimpanzee, uh, part of this pallor that we can see dissecting between the muscle fibers is actually amyloidosis. But in the most cases, it's a fibrosing cardiomyopathy. Uh, the exact etiology and pathogenesis is unknown. Very seldom do we see atherosclerosis in the arteries of the heart of these animals that might account for this. Accompanying this, we often see polyploidy in the hearts of primates, not only zoo housed or vivarial housed, but also in the wild. And we know that this lesion can be induced by catecholamines. So one theory is that repeated bouts of stress um, and catecholamine release leads to tachycardias and um, poor perfusion of the heart muscle itself, which leads to the dropout in interstitial fibrosis and the polyploidy that we see. To support this, we often see a hyaline arteriopathy in hearts of some of these animals. Now, this doesn't mean that it's poor management in captivity. Since we do see it in wild animals as well, it might just be a reflection of how stressful it is to be a social animal like a primate. We also see uh, dissecting aortic aneurysms occasionally. It's, a cause, it's been recognized as a cause of sudden death, particularly in gorillas, but we've also seen it in other animals like bonobos and in this case a, um, a Duke Langer. Uh, these are usually supravalvular in the ascending aorta, and here we can appreciate this dissection in this particular animal. And they're not always associated with atherosclerosis. Here's um, a supravalvular rent near the ostium. Um, here's a subvalvular hemorrhage as well. And heart disease in some species is related to hypertension. Again, pathogenesis unknown. This is a woolly monkey. And woolly monkeys are recognized to develop a hypertensive lesion and uh, heart failure with uh, hydropericardium, hydrothorax, hepatomegaly, and um, ascites. Uh, the hearts will be enlarged. Here you can see left atrial enlargement as well uh, with abundant interstitial fibrosis. And <coughs> typical lesions of hypertension with hyaline arteriopathy and onion skin fibrosis of the arteries. Uh, New World monkeys may also have lesions of heart failure. And um, we can see here 
an enlarged liver from a um, pygmy marmoset. Um, this liver is also enlarged because of marked extramedullary hematopoiesis. And many of the New World monkeys, including pygmy marmosets, um, owl monkeys, and in this case, a Geldes marmoset, uh, will have pretty impressive extramedullary hematopoiesis and even nodular extramedullary hematopoiesis and um, mylolipomas in their livers, as we're seeing here. As animals age, we also see increased numbers of tumors here in adrenal adenocarcinoma in a Geldes marmoset and also these chronically scarred kidneys um, that we often expect to see. And arthritis is common as animals age, particularly in the great apes, particularly in the knees of orangutans who are spending probably more time on the ground than they were designed to spend. Reproduction is an important issue in zoological collections and we do see reproductive diseases. The patus monkeys and some of the colubine monkeys will develop preeclampsia, which leads to uh, intramembranous hemorrhage and um, placental infarction demonstrated here. And um, preeclampsia can be diagnosed with placental examination, and placental sh placenta should be examined routinely in all primates in zoological collections. And here we can see this abundance of syncytial knots uh, suggestive of preeclampsia. And of course, uh, this sort of problem in the dam can lead to hypoxia in the infant and fetal death. We're seeing hypoxic hemorrhages here in the brain. So that concludes my presentation. I've barely covered um, the diseases that we see in primates and zoological collections. I think the take home message is that you need to know something about the biology of the animals to interpret the lesions that you see. Um, you, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in non-human primate pathology, particularly elucidating things like the cause of the aortic aneurysms, the cause of chronic renal disease, and a variety of other things. And so since you're watching this tape, I presume you're interested in non-human primates, and I urge you to get involved and to support the efforts of um, things like the species survival plans uh, by becoming involved in, in one or more species of non-human primates and trying to understand more about their diseases so we can better maintain them in captivity. Thank you.